Once again, I'm delighted to be here with you and, and talk to you about a completely different topic from my lecture, what may seem to be, have been weeks and weeks ago, um, <laughs> given what you all have been through and what you've heard. And, and I'd like to begin by just making a few general comments. There's no doubt that all of you are here because you have had a lifelong commitment to learning. And I would imagine that a big part of that capacity and that interest came from your experience at Lafayette in the first place. And I have to tell you that's one of the reasons I was drawn to come to this college as well. And that culture operates at all levels. And I have maintained an active intellectual life in addition to my own professional responsibilities as president. And I want to talk to you today about the work I'm doing right now, a project that I've been involved in. And so to begin the story, I begin with a narrative that's more about me than it is about my subject, but will quickly shift over to my subject. And that subject, properly speaking, is the Vietnam War as seen and experienced by a young man who you see up on the screen named Michael O'Donnell, who was one of 58,200 some casualties of the war, who had his own story just as the others all had a story, and whose story connected with me in ways that compelled me to conduct research and to write this book. So I'd like to tell you that story and talk about the war and how we understand the war and what contributions this young man made to our understanding of that time. Under, unlike my first lecture, where I could speak as an authority about something that none of you have lived through or experienced, we're in a very different place today. Many of you will remember what I'm talking about. You may have opinions or perspectives or information that contributes to this subject. As last time, I welcome the opportunity to hear your thoughts and your criticisms and your suggestions as we go. So let's keep that, uh, that in mind as we proceed. The story begins about Seven or eight years ago, I was leafing through a book called The American Century by Harold Evans. It's a coffee table book about the 20th century, studying the history of American economy and politics primarily. And in that book, there was a small section on the Vietnam War, and it talked about various aspects of the war. And there was a small photograph of this man that you see here, and below that, a poem. And it said that this poem was written by this man who was a helicopter pilot, he wrote it on January 1st, 1970, while stationed in Vietnam, serving as a helicopter pilot. And less than three months after writing the poem, he was shot down and listed as missing in action. And as of the time of the publication of American Century in 2000, or 1999, he was still missing in action. So 28, 29 years later, Michael O'Donnell was still an unknown casualty of the war in Vietnam. Let me begin by reading the poem, and then we'll talk a little bit about where it leads us. Imagine this young man sitting, by the way, in his base in northern Vietnam in the city of Khantum, a base that was 30, 40 kilometers from both North Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos, an outpost that was removed from the entire world. These guys had no knowledge of what was happening anywhere on the planet other than what was happening on their base every day. They flew missions every single day into enemy territory and took casualties on a regular basis, and many of Michael's friends had died. O'Donnell had been in Vietnam at the time of this writing for about three months. If you are able, save a place for them inside of you, and save one backward glance when you are leaving for the places they can no longer go. Be not ashamed to say you love them, though you may or may not have always. Take what they have left and what they have taught you with their dying, and keep it with your own. And in that time, when men decide and feel safe to call the war insane, take one moment to embrace those gentle heroes you left behind. So he writes this poem, tucks it into a letter to his best friend, Marcus Sullivan, who was his college roommate and his, a collaborator of his musically. They were on their way in 1963 to be Simon and Garfunkel before Simon and Garfunkel. They made an album. They recorded music. They, the world was ahead of them, Marcus and Michael. When Marcus, so I'll get ahead of myself a little, Michael was in Vietnam then and he writes this poem and he sends it back to Marcus in a letter saying in the letter that um, I just wrote this and I'm putting it in my collection of poetry. Michael was writing poetry. I was very moved by this poem and curious to know more about who had written it and under what circumstances had he written this poem. And all the more surprising to me that that short, or I should say coincidental, that after this poem was written, this young man was himself left behind. So I began to do a little bit of research and to look into this, and I discovered that this poem was quite famous. 
and it appeared in very many places, and we'll come back to that, that it wasn't only and uniquely published in this book, The American Century. I was able to locate Marcus Sullivan, his best friend, who is a retired English teacher living in, um, in uh, Illinois. It's Crystal Lake, Illinois. And I wrote to him. I did not know where this was going to take me. I'm a medieval guy. But I was interested in learning more about this story because something in, t in me said, there's a story here to learn and that I'd be curious about. So I went to go meet with Marcus Sullivan in Whitewater and learn more about this story and with the idea that maybe I'll write an article about this or I'll do something like that. Marcus Sullivan turns out himself to be a remarkable man. He told me much about Michael O'Donnell and the story. He shared with me the context in which this poem was written. And I was convinced by the end of a three-hour lunch that there's a book in this topic that Marcus and I should write together and tell this story. Not because Michael O'Donnell's story is singularly distinctive or original, but because it's representative, an exemplar of a certain kind of story that came out of that time in America and in Vietnam that I thought was especially powerful. So Marcus and I set on our, fir the first step of our project was to get the materials for the story. What can we gather together to tell this story? And what is the whole story that we will tell? Because Marcus was Michael's best friend at the time Michael was killed, he was able to connect us fairly quickly to many people in Michael's life, including most important, Michael's sister, Patsy, who was now living, also retired, living in Las Vegas, who had all of the materials associated with Michael's life. And we flew out there to meet with her and she was able to provide me with, oops, to provide us with a whole host of materials. And so here was a unique opportunity. Unlike writing about Louis IX, where I'd have to look at the glass of the Saint Chapelle, I had here several boxes filled with everything left from this young man's life. His birth certificate, his military correspondence, including every letter written by the United States Army from the time this young man enlisted till the time his body was found 35 years later. Um, photographs, I have here just a listing of some things. All of the poetry that Michael wrote, the songs that he wrote, the correspondence he had with the government and then subsequently his family had with it. The letters from Presidents Carter and Nixon. Newspaper clippings, all kinds of materials. So we were able to begin to establish an archive that could help us fill out this story in ways that might be, I thought, uniquely advantageous to this project. Beyond that, we identified other people that were important to Michael and we were able to interview them. So the story begins to get filled out in the first steps by having access to a bunch of material. Michael's best friend from Vietnam, the guy who was flying the mission at the time Michael was killed, was, was also available to us and we found him. It turned out Michael was engaged and we found the woman he was going to marry. So we were able to interview all of these people and to gather together this material and create an archive that allowed us to begin to tell this story. And I was persuaded after this process, this took several months, maybe a year, that there was a story here that could be told that would be quite interesting and that Michael O'Donnell's life, as I said, was quite compelling. The next step was to reflect on what could one say about the war in Vietnam that hasn't already been said. What contribution can we make that is interesting or unique or important? And it got me to reading about the war in Vietnam. And there's lots of different kinds of material, as all of you know. Most of you lived through that period and its aftermath. There was a substantial amount of journalism that took place during the war, including daily reports by reporters in Vietnam, and we all remember the helicopter images on the 6 o'clock news every single day for nearly a decade. There were memoirs that came out of the war. Philip Caputo wrote The Rumor of War, Ron Kovitz, uh, Kovitz's book, Born on the Fourth of July, Neil Sheehan's account of John Paul Van many, many military accounts of the war written by soldiers who were there who had one angle or another on what happened to them and to their colleagues. Most important probably of this body of material, biographies, autobiographies, memoirs, was Robert McNamara's book in retrospect published in 1995 where McNamara acknowledged what they knew and didn't know in the middle 1960s when Lyndon Johnson was president and they were making decisions about the war that weren't being shared fully with the American people. His book was revelatory, truly astounding in some ways, because what it told us about the relationship of the government to the people during the 1960s. That was a very powerful bit of information. There was a lot of fiction and poetry written about the war. We've all seen it. We've all come across it in a variety of ways. Tim O'Brien's book, The Things They Carried, and many others. The poetry of John Balaban. 
Another great milestone was the film in 1978, The Deer Hunter, which was the first and most powerful representation of these soldiers as conflicted and traumatized individuals. <coughs> so moved by this film was Jan Scruggs, a veteran himself, that he began an initiative at that time with his own $2,800 to have a memorial constructed on the, on the mall in honor of Vietnam veterans. And that led by 1982, rather, to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. <coughs> And then over time, there became increasingly more historical accounts, synthetic documents, that is, syntheses of various kinds of material that gave us some perspective on what was really happening in the war, or at least the account of historians and perspectives on the war. Within all of that material, then, the book that we set out to write was intended to be in some ways quite distinct from those categories. What we're writing is not what I would call, for lack of a better term, a contextual biography. It's about one life. But through that life, it oscillates between the local experiences day to day of a soldier in Vietnam with the relationship of that life to the larger policies and events that went on around him. And because he lived in some ways a quite distinctive life in this time, he fought in the war, he died as a hero in the war, he was missing in action for 28 years and his family interacted with the government for 28 years, receiving several letters a year, often one a month, saying things like, an individual resembling your son Michael was sighted on the streets of Saigon and further investigation is underway and we will be informing you as soon as we know more. And then they would get another letter six weeks later saying the individual is not your son. This went on for 28 years. So what was it like for them? What kind of experience did this have on them? How did this life of Michael O'Donnell affect the lives around him? How were their trajectory of their lives redirected by virtue of what happened to him? and multiply that by 58,200 in just this one war, and we begin to develop a perspective on how profoundly impacted by war we all are. And that was something I sought to try to do with this book. So we had in mind a book, we outlined the book, and we began to tell the story. So let me tell you the story that we begin, are beginning to tell. As you know, 58,200 American soldiers died in Vietnam. Many, many millions more died from the other side and from South Vietnam. This was a major war. It was, however, not the most catastrophic war in terms of casualties to the US in the 20th century. But there's little doubt now, in retrospect, that this was one of the most consequential events in the 20th century in American history. And I say this for three reasons, and there may be more. First of all, because of what we've learned about the kinds of relationships that citizens can have with this government and that I think for so many of us who came out of the generation of the Second World War and had a certain attitude and understanding of the role of soldiers and the, the role of government, the confidence that one had in the judgment of the government and its capacity to be candid and their respect for the competence of government to do the work that we entrust them to do was profoundly challenged in the 1960s at levels that I think was not characteristic of previous generations. At least in retrospect, it would appear from the historical materials that that was the case. None of this was helped by the ensuing years with Watergate and everything else that we've all lived through. That was the first reason. The second was that Vietnam was not the first, but maybe the most obvious example of the limitations of limited war as a strategy. Limited war was an idea that is in some ways counterintuitive. Let's not try to annihilate the other country and end this thing. But let's take a more narrowly focused view. There, indeed, in Vietnam, we're fighting a counterinsurgency that is not so different from what's happening in Afghanistan and Iraq today. And indeed, when I started this book, those wars were just beginning. And the parallels today are really quite, quite um, powerful. So the idea of limited war as a strategy that, that was being affected had, I think, a profound effect on the way we think about military might in the nuclear age. And third, and maybe in some ways the book deals with this more fully, the place of the soldier in our society. The young men primarily, but women as well, who went to Vietnam were almost all born right after the end of the Second World War. They grew up with parents who fought in the Second World War and whatever happened to them, they came home as heroes. They were celebrated, they were lauded, they had access to the GI Bill, they built homes, they got jobs, they participated in the flourishing economy and one of the brightest moments in the 20th century in America. So it is not surprising that in the early stages of this war in Vietnam that many of these young men had no idea what they were getting into when they agreed 
to serve or when they were drafted because they expected that their experience would not be different from that of the generation before them. And we all know how untrue that turned out to be. So for that reason as well, that's the third reason, the place of the soldier in our society is, has became a much more problematic issue and I think has had long-standing consequences here. So for all of those reasons, I think the Vietnam War is very important. What do we know about the Vietnam War historically? And I will not spend a lot of time on, on this because I think it isn't necessary and most of you are familiar with it. During the Second World War, Ho Chi Minh, who was a revolutionary in Vietnam, was an ally of the Americans in helping them in a variety of ways, particularly against the Japanese. Beginning in 1945, this charismatic revolutionary organized an army to battle the French who had been occupying Vietnam for many, many years. They wanted independence from outside rule, and Vietnam had many centuries of a history of not being able to be independent. Finally, in 1954, they achieved victory over the French who withdrew. And the agreement struck by the Geneva Accords at that time was that the nation of Vietnam would be divided at the 17th parallel, divided in half between North and South, for two years, during which time the UN could help participate in the development of a process for a national election. Does all of this sound familiar? We all read about Afghanistan? And Ho Chi Minh held dominion over the North, and in the South, we made an alliance with the Diem brothers. In 1956, at the time that this election was to be held, it was determined by many, including the American intelligence officers, that if there were such an election, Ho Chi Minh would win. So there cannot be such an election because we didn't have confidence he would be an able, appropriate ally, primarily because of his propensity to engage with the communists. One mistake, in my view, and this is a con an issue we can talk about, was that right from the start, the US made the mistake of assuming all of this was about communism and containment, rather than about independence on the part of a people for their country. And that was why the Vietnamese fought so assiduously against the French and the Americans because what they were seeking was independence. It wasn't that they were rapacious communists. Communists provided them with access to men and materials so that Ho Chi Minh had behind him China and the Soviet Union, which was a way to battle the United States. Yes, sir? Well, at the end of the Second World War, you had mentioned that Ho Chi Minh was an ally of the, of the, uh, uh, the United States in the Second World War. The there was a conscious decision by the United States under, under Eisenhower to return French Indochina to the French in preference to Ho Chi Minh. So that part of the, this part of the animosity that uh, Ho Chi Minh developed for the West was because of the decision, he essentially was betrayed right. by the, uh, by the uh, Allied powers at the end of World War II by reestablishing the French colonial government in French Indo, what was French Indochina. So that's what, part of the reason why he had turned to the, uh, to the Russians primarily for support in fighting the French. Yes, that's a very good point. I appreciate you raising it. Thank you. Yes, sir. It was before that when Ho Chi Minh applied to Harry Truman for assistance and, uh, uh, and Truman would not recognize or support him. So it was before Eisenhower. Right. A long history at that time of, of some ways, but betrayal. Yes, sir. Uh, you said that uh, <coughs> the Ho Chi Minh turned to the Russians and the Chinese. Weren't the Chinese an historical enemy of the Vietnamese and uh, somewhat, the, the relations between them were somewhat uh, strained? Well, they were, but not at that time. That is to say that Ho Chi Minh was able to gain access to resources from China because of a common enemy. So, you know, that's so often the case in international politics. So. Thank you, that's all very helpful. So what happens then is, is in 1956, the election is a failure and Ho Chi Minh initiates uh, another insurrection to try to reclaim the country and that in turn led to our involvement in the war. Um, our concern being primarily, as I said, the issue of containment. So we find ourselves increasingly involved in this war. John F. Kennedy talked a great deal about the war in Vietnam, but didn't live long enough to do anything about it. It's not clear to his closest advisors what he would have done. Ted Sorensen says he believes it never would have happened that Kennedy would have escalated the war once he started to focus in on the issues. But one doesn't know. One doesn't know. Kennedy didn't live. Johnson inherited the presidency, as all of you know, and in 1964, 
The Gulf of Tonkin incident in August of 1964, followed immediately by the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, led to the capacity of the president to increase the war because national interests were at stake. And that led to the escalation of the war that, un that then unfolded in large numbers through the early and mid-60s. In 1963, there were 16,000 American soldiers in Vietnam. In 1966, there were 400,000 soldiers in Vietnam, a very significant increase in forces. So during those years and during this period, we all saw America sinking into what was to turn out a morass in Southeast Asia. At this time, Michael O'Donnell and Marcus Sullivan were on their way to becoming, as I said, a popular singing group. They weren't worried about much else. Michael's grades in college, he was at the University of Whitewater, Wisconsin at Whitewater with Marcus Sullivan. Neither one of them were scholars. They weren't paying a lot of attention in class. Yes, sir? What year was uh, Michael born? 1945. So they were making music at this time. Indeed, they, as I said, they made an album. I have here just a few snapshots to capture that time a little bit. This is Michael with his mother and his sister, Patsy here in this image, and we'll jump along a little bit. Uh, as I said, I received an archive of actually an interesting digression for the moment. When I got to Las Vegas, I'm a perfect stranger of Patsy O'Donnell. And I was there, of course, with Marcus, whom she knew well. Because we wanted to do this project, her, she was, there were two children in the family, Michael and Patsy. Patsy had, was about to enter the Peace Corps and get on with her life, graduating from the University of Wisconsin at Madison at the time that Michael decided to enlist. And I'll come back to that story in one second. There were only the two parents and the two children. When Michael was listed as missing in action, in the mid-1980s, Patsy's father died of a heart attack, never knowing what became of his son. And shortly thereafter, the mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and, in short order, was unable to remember anything about her family. So Patsy carried the burden of this brother of hers who was missing in action all of these years. And when we told her we wanted to do this project, and she obviously trusted us, she went into a closet and brought out two enormous cardboard boxes and gave me everything. His birth certificate, his childhood photos, everything. And I tried to figure that out. What was that about? She obviously loved her brother. It was a kind of liberation for her. She had carried this burden her whole life about her brother's her brother's legacy, the access to information about her brother. And here were two people she trusted willing to take this on for her. So here in the president's house at Lafayette, I have all of this material, everything. And that somehow was very liberating for his sister, though that was in no way disloyal. So in 1964, in their Beatle Bob haircuts, these two guys were on their way to have a musical career. They were, by most measures, pretty good and on their way to getting better. They both wrote music, although Michael wrote more of the music and Marcus had the real voice, but they harmonized beautifully. And this is what they look like in the promotional materials, and this is what they really looked like. <laughs> they were just kids in the 1960s, like the rest of us. And the three of them, so on the, on the right is Marcus Sullivan, in the middle is Michael, and on the left is their other friend, Greg Stagebird. They wrote music and they performed. Among the materials I found in the archive was the album they made. It was not um, a major national release album, but it was very good and very touching. And in addition to that, I also got in the archive a series of reel-to-reel -reel tapes that Michael made while he was on deployment that he sent back to Marcus. So talking to his friend, reading, the, playing the songs he had just written, a kind of immediate access that I didn't get with Louis IX, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and I can sit there and listen to these recordings and feel like I'm talking to the subject of my project. So here, I'm just very briefly going to play this. I have one song here, just so you can get a sense for what they sounded like back in those days. See, 
get a sense of what they were up to. They, uh, they harmonized well, as I said, and they were developing music. They, were not, um, they weren't Simon and Garfunkel, even Michael O'Donnell acknowledged in his letters. He, he actually, one of the things that's so interesting about this project is I have all of this material, so Michael O'Donnell was prodigiously interested in music. And there are letters to Marcus such as, Marcus, I gotta tell you, I just bought an album of this guy, and he's really good. His name is, well, the group is called Simon and Garfunkel, and they're really good. That bastard, Simon, can really play music. And <laughs> <laughs> so he, had his, he had a good ear. He knew who was on their way. He said he had another letter about James Taylor, the same thing. You never heard of this guy, but he's, he's really good, and he's going to be good. So Marcus and Michael then, while they were at the University of Wisconsin, Whitewater, were making music. They were traveling around the country and performing when they could out of school, um, and sometimes when they weren't supposed to. They went to Chicago and played in Old Town. They went to New York. They performed with Jose Feliciano, with Chad Mitchell, with Joe Mapes, and they had a thing going. And in the middle of all this, Marcus was drafted. In August of 1966, Marcus was drafted. He had just graduated, and he was drafted. So Michael had the idea, not especially interested in school and very devoted to his friend, and seeing that the world seemed to be going in this direction in Vietnam, and maybe there's an adventure in all of this. He was, after all, a young man. He enlisted. And his thought was he would learn to become a helicopter pilot because that's a skill that's of some use. And at the end of the war, he could use that skill. And more important, it takes so damn long to learn how to fly one of these things that by the time he knows how, the war will surely be over. That was his plan. So he enlisted just a few weeks after Marcus was drafted. <coughs> and a major chapter, of course, in his life changes. At the time that he did that, he was engaged to this woman, Jane. And they had met, they had been classmates in high school, and they reconnected uh, while Michael was just starting his military training. And this is a picture Michael took of her the last time he ever saw her. Uh, and what's so striking is, of course, we found Jane. She lives now in Panama City, Florida, where she is probably right now picking up oil off the beach. But I was down there many times. It's a beautiful spot. And there she is when we found her and looks exactly the same. It's really <laughs> stunning. Um, wonderful person. No, she hadn't. So Michael enlists, and he becomes a helicopter pilot. So he goes to officer candidate training school, and first to Fort Walters in Texas, and then Fort Rucker in Alabama. And he comes to develop, uh, he's trained so that he's able to fly what are called slicks. These are Hueys, Bell helicopters, that were, for the most part, they had door gunners, but they weren't armament, they weren't gunships, they mostly flew rescue missions, and they flew soldiers in and out of battle. A major part of the counterinsurgency strategy of the war was what uh, General Westmoreland and others called search and destroy. The war was never about conquering territory. In this way, it was also a limited war. The, uh, the objective wasn't to take Berlin. The objective was to kill the enemy and wear them down until eventually they will surrender or withdraw. So the Americans and the South Vietnamese would consistently have battles and skirmishes and claim territory and then give it up. But in order to engage in a counterinsurgency strategy, you have to find the enemy. And this enemy did not wear uniforms and stand in an obvious place. They were either invisible or indistinguishable from civilians. So it was maddening for the soldiers. They didn't know how to fight this kind of enemy. They weren't trained to do it in the beginning. But helicopters facilitated this war because they could move soldiers and materials quickly, getting into battles, getting out of battles. So Michael became a pilot flying a slick, and the idea was that that's the kind of work that he would do. After his training was completed, he had a bit of a, a, a leave, just a few weeks, where he was able to spend some time with Jane. And he wrote two poems the day before he left, which I'd like to read to you. I'm going to read just a couple of poems from him, just so you can get a sense of the kind of things that he was saying and writing. One of them was on his birthday, on the 13th of August, 1969. He knew he was going to be deployed in the next few weeks. 24 should be a great deal like 23, waiting for the acne to find someplace else to go. 24 will be a year lost to the war. 24 will be the year I waited to be 25. I shall be watching myself very closely. The night before he left, he was with Jane. And he wrote the following poem. Tomorrow, I'll be leaving. Tonight, I spent some time walking. I was going to think about all the things I was going to miss, but I tried not to think about you. 
I wanted to put some important things in glass jars and tighten the lids for the trip. I would open them as I needed to. Geritol for the soul. I didn't want to think about you. I kicked up the stones along the alleyway behind the house and tapped a stick I found to no familiar rhyme. I was not going to think about you. You were all I thought about. The next day he flew to Vietnam, and his poetry, not surprising, takes on a very different cast when he arrived in Vietnam. He was assigned to the 170th Assault Helicopter Company. Their mission was, among other things, to fly support for the special operations groups that were operating throughout Vietnam. These were the highest trained guys, the special ops guys, who would get airlifted into secret places in all kinds of places where we weren't supposed to be to do either various kinds of espionage work or to, to engage in, uh, in attacks on the enemy. The 170th was assigned to do this first from Ply Ku, which is in the north central part of South Vietnam. And then after several months, they were moved to Kantum, this unit that, I, as I said, was very far to the north, an outpost in the middle of surrounded by enemy territory with access to nothing. And they flew these missions almost every single day. So imagine what the life was like for these pilots. And I know that some of you in the room have had experiences like this as well. So again, I don't claim that O'Donnell's was absolutely unique, but I will tell you what it was like. Each day they would get up and be given their orders for the day. So RT Illinois is going to fly, do a secret mission in Cambodia. And I need O'Donnell and his team to take those guys in there. They'll be out tomorrow. And they would fly, they would gather up these special ops guys fly secretly into this location, drop them off, and fly out, more often than not while receiving gunfire. Because years later, I mean many years later, they found out, found out that one of the South Vietnamese officers in the planning group for these special ops was a North v Vietnamese agent who tipped off every single mission. And that's why every single time they landed, they were already getting shot at. Um, but that was what it was like. And at the end of each day, hot and tired, O'Donnell would return to his base, land his helicopter, go have dinner, take a shower, and reflect on the day. So unlike being an infantry officer where you were in the war in a kind of intensive way, he had time to reflect on his experience before he faced it the next day again. That caused him to write a whole range of poems. And, and let me just tell you that as we were doing our research, we found a lot of people that uh, were connected to Michael. On the left, you see Michael standing with his friend Bobby Ross. Bobby Ross was from Louisiana. They met in helicopter school. And Bobby was, Michael called him, my very favorite redneck. Bobby had every weapon in the world, loved the war, had grenades around his neck. He just couldn't get enough of it. And Michael wasn't like that at all. But Bobby loved him. And I went to see Bobby in, in Louisiana during this project. And he talked about Michael's capacity to connect with everybody. And that he knew that, you know, that they weren't exactly from the same cloth. But they were nonetheless dear friends. And Bobby had all kinds of materials as well that, from that time and about Michael. One of the other folks that we found, I'm going to come back to my narrative in just a second, was a guy named Jim Lake. Jim was a helicopter pilot in the 170th, serving with Michael. And on the day of the mission that Michael never returned from, the commander of that mission was Jim Lake, this guy. And uh, we went to see Jim and talk to him. He never recovered from that day. There he, that's what he looked like then. However, most astonishingly, he retired from the US Army one year ago. He went into the Army in 1967 and he retired last year. He flew several years missions in Afghanistan and Iraq, and here he is at near the end of his career flying fixed-wing aircraft, soldiers in and out of uh, the war today. Really interesting guy. We'll come back to him. When Michael was in helicopter school, this is the kind of helicopter he was learning to fly. That's him on the left with the sunglasses. He was also a bit of a smart ass, so he found this sign and he thought it was sort of clever. So he stood next to it and sent it home to his mother. <laughs> I think she'd be amused about what he was learning in the Army. <laughs> when he arrived then in Vietnam, he was, as I said, with the 170th unit. There were two helicopter groups within the 170th. One were called Buccaneers. Those were gunships. They flew in and out. Their job was to inflict damage on the enemy. The other were the slicks that I talked about. They called themselves bikinis because they thought of themselves as profoundly exposed and vulnerable, since they had very little bit in the way of weapons. And most of these helicopters had women in bikinis on the front of them. 
And I know many of you would want to see that, so I brought one in. <laughs> Here we see O'Donnell in Vietnam on the left. He's in the sunglasses. So during this time then, he's flying these missions and having these experiences and also writing about them at night. Interestingly, most of the people in his unit were not poets. They were more like Bobby Ross than Michael O'Donnell. But they all knew what he was doing. They knew he was writing about this, and they cherished him for that because they thought he was doing something important. He was reflecting on their experience as one who lived it, but also could record <coughs> it in a way that was powerful. So he wrote the following poem about a month after he was in Vietnam. Each of us is a can of tomato paste, and though we may all not have the same label, as we spin through the air when we land too hard or get torn from the outside or within, we spill out and stain the hands of everyone who knew us. He wrote that, as I said, during his time flying. He was also reflecting on this time about his relationship with Jane. He had been away for several months. He talked a lot in his letters to her as well as to Marcus that with every passing day, that font, that reservoir of memories was disappearing, and he had nothing to replace them with. So his life was draining away from him as he could see it. Though never, in any of his letters or any of his poems, did he complain. It wasn't, wasn't self-conscious complaining. It was just describing what it was like to be a soldier in Vietnam in his world. Marcus, served, Marcus went into the infantry. He went to Vietnam. He was there for 12 months, and he came home. So before Michael ever got out of helicopter school, Marcus was back teaching English in, in Wisconsin. Another poem that Michael wrote, this was reflecting on Jane and his situation there. Like dreams carved from bars of ivory soap, you float by and melt away with each passing, with the passing of each day growing smaller and smaller until there is nothing left of you to touch. So again, the sensibility that goes into the, his perceptions of his experience while at the same time flying these battles, these, these missions every day, I thought was a very profound juxtaposition. Here, there are a variety of photographs taken of, of Michael while he was there from various people. We gathered them up over the years uh, by cracking down some of his colleagues. Here's Michael and a friend and another guy sitting on the roof of their helicopter. And then one of the things that's very interesting is many of these soldiers, and some of you may know this, they're flying missions, and they're also tape, re tape recording what's going on over the radio. They're taking pictures out the window. They were capturing this experience in all <coughs> kinds of ways. Bobby Ross, the inveterate guy I told you about before, gave me, because he thought I would be interested in this, <laughs> he said, I got something you'd really be interested in. I got recordings of these guys flying missions in their helicopters. So you can hear them talking to each other during battles. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. And he said, just a minute, let me go get it. And he came back with 24 CDs. 9,000 hours of this. And I thought, uh, you know, I don't know what I can listen to, like 10, but I have them all. And, you know, mostly you can't even hear what they're saying. But, but like gunfire? In the back some of it. A lot of it is, as you know, pilots Marble, even today, you can't hear what, what they're talking about. Yeah, 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 good. Okay, something just happened, but I don't know what it was. But I have, and we have photographs, we have film, we have recordings, and Bobby Ross has them all. So he passed that on to us. So here you see these guys taking pictures of each other while they're flying around. When Michael was stationed then in Khantoum, as I said, this base is an important part of the story. They were really an outpost, surrounded by the enemy, and there wasn't much else to do. So Jim Lake told me when I met with him that what life was like in Khantoum for these guys was the following. They'd fly the missions all day that I've described. They would typically not fly missions at night. So they'd come back to the base and land, and here you see the control tower at Khantoum Airfield. They'd go in and take a shower. They'd grab a few beers and get something to eat. And they would climb the tower because every single day at the same time, the enemy would attack with great big, he described them as telephone pole missiles that were loud as, as locomotives, but that weren't particularly effective. So they'd sit up in this tower, and this is what they would watch. Just They didn't have TV, so this is what they did. And he said they weren't nervous. It wasn't a kind of fearsome thing. It was just what what a crazy turned around world they lived in. And that's what they had. So that was Contum. Jim went back to Contum in 2003, and he took this picture. And if you look closely, this is Contum Airfield. And you can see that there's still American tanks in the fields there in 2003. Um,
Oh. Yeah. Now you can see them a little bit better. Yeah. So there's some cattle. These are and their homes here, but this is where they served in Khantum. And here's another photograph of that base. It was a profound experience for Jim to go back there, given all that he had been through. The living conditions in these bases were such that because they were being bombed every day, all of their, their barracks were surrounded by sandbags and pretty heavily fortified. Many of these guys slept in bunks that were completely surrounded by sandbags. They'd get in a little cocoon every night. That was what it was like. So again, during this time, Michael's writing about the war. Let me read two other poems that he wrote at this time. Heaven knows I'm not so proud of everything I've done. I mean, I've let some people down. And heaven knows there are so many things left I've got to do. God knows I'm not sure of him these days. He also knows why. People are bleeding to death in the back of my helicopter, and he understands how we can wash the floor clean and just one day later forget he knows anything at all. So every day, this is what he was experiencing. On March 18, 1970, O'Donnell was flying missions in northern in Khantum out of a small airfield called Dok To, which was just another 10 or 20 kilometers north of Khantum. And you could throw a rock from Dok To over the, over the border to North Vietnam. So it was right there on the edge. And that was where they staged their special operations missions every day. And they would fly these guys in and then go back and sit around at the airfield all day in the 110 degree sun and then go back into battle and fly them home. And he wrote this poem. I have tasted the air in the early morning, before the sun and before the day. I have let it run all down my face and stain my clothes. And I have learned to wash myself with the part of the day that remains. I am dying in the sun at Dock Toe. I am each day becoming less interested in the way the morning tastes. And I am dying in the sun at Dock Toe. And I am dying in the sun at Dock Toe. That was the last poem he ever wrote. On March 24th, RT Pennsylvania, a special operations group of three American soldiers and five indigenous Montagnard soldiers, were to be sent into battle. Uh, actually, it was on March 21st. They went, into, they went into Cambodia to do a reconnaissance mission. That mission had been leaked to the enemy. So Jim Lake, remember Jim Lake, who was the mission commander, he flew them in on March 21st. As he was putting them on the ground, they came under fire. During the next two days, RT Pennsylvania, these eight guys were simply running the whole time. They were, they were being chased by the enemy. One, the first night, they were able to stop briefly and hold them off, but they just kept running. So on the morning then of the, of the 24th, they radioed back and said, abort the mission. We have to be extracted. We're, they're catching up with us, and we cannot. We're exhausted. We're running out of ammunition. We need to be extracted. So O'Donnell was told, along with his unit, Jim Lake and others, that that's what they were going to do that day. So they went to Dock Toe and stood by. They got their helicopters ready, and they just waited. And as soon as there was radio communication with the team that they would be coming to a place where they could be rescued, the unit would be sent in. They were about 20 minutes away from where the unit would be. There was a Covey rider, the fixed wing pilot, who was flying above the mission, was the person who was looking down through binoculars at all of this happening. And he was choreographing these events. And he gave special instructions then to the unit, the special ops guys, and told them where to go. And then O'Donnell and the others were told where they should go to make this extraction. So to do an extraction like this requires about eight helicopters and three airplanes in order to keep everybody safe. There were four gunships that were sent. There were four slicks, transport helicopters, that were sent. And then there were three fixed-wing aircraft up above, one to choreograph all the activity, who commanded all the units, the other two who dropped bombs when necessary. How big was uh, the unit the Vietnamese were after? Hundreds. Know. Hundreds. Must been a and they had dogs. I mean, they were, they were many, many, many. But no one really knew because there wasn't supposed to be anybody there when they landed. Right. This was not planned. So these eight guys then were racing like fast as they could to be rescued at the location where the pickup would be. The eight helicopters and three airplanes were circling above for a long time. And the special ops guys did not arrive. So Jim Lake, who was commanding the mission, made the decision to send back everybody but two gunships and one slick to get fuel, because they weren't going to be able to stay there if they didn't. And they didn't believe that the special ops guys would arrive at the landing zone soon. So Lake told O'Donnell to stay there, 
and the two gunships to go in and do what they had to do. And the other helicopters all went back to base. While they were gone then, the action started to heat up and these guys, the special ops guys, started to lose ground. The commander of the unit fell and broke his ankle and he radioed up, if we don't get rescued right now, we're going to die. So the only one up there who could do anything was O'Donnell. The two gunships flew down there and emptied their armaments almost instantly and flew away. And only O'Donnell was there. As soon as he received that radio communication, he said, I'm going down. Because all of these pilots operated by a creed that you always, always take them out. You never leave them. So he went to the ground by himself. As he was coming down, Jim Lake and the rest of the uh, uh, helicopters were coming into, into view. They were, they were within visual range of all of what was happening. O'Donnell had just hit the ground, landed. And Jim Lake said, come up, we're here, we can help you. And O'Donnell saw these guys coming and he saw the people behind them shooting at them and he said, I'm not, I'm gonna pick them up. So these eight soldiers got on his helicopter, he sat on the ground for four minutes taking live fire, and then lifted off the ground and pulled away. And his last words were, I've got them, I'm coming out. As he rose beyond the trees and started to move through the valley, his plane was blown, his helicopter was hit twice. The first time it just started to catch on fire and because it was moving forward quickly, it flew forward a few hundred yards, then it was hit again and it went down into the valley and exploded. So Jim Lake commanded everyone else to stay high above range and he went down to take a look and he couldn't get anywhere close because of the fire that was going on. They sent one of the gunships down which could fly much more quickly. All they saw were tremendous amounts of fire around the helicopter and there was no way they could get within range and it was all dense jungle. So Lake, he gave the order for everybody to come up above gun, above firing range and to return to base. And when he told me this story last summer, he broke down in tears and wept about it because he should have been the one on the ground doing that and he's never forgiven himself for that. That's the way it is with these guys. So they flew back to the base and O'Donnell was listed as missing in action. Those who were with him had very little doubt that no one survived. But they were in Cambodia before Richard Nixon publicly announced we were going to be in Cambodia. This was on the 24th of March, 1970. It was a month later when Nixon made the speech that we are invading Cambodia, which in turn led to the Kent State and other riots in the United States. So O'Donnell was persona non grata. They were not going to inform the family where this had taken place. They were unable to mount any kind of effective rescue mission because they couldn't get into that place. It was too dangerous. And they informed the family simply that he has been shot down and we don't have any real information as to what happened. He is missing. We'll get back to you as soon as we can with more information. Three days later, an armed officer arrived at the O'Donnell household with a little bit more information that just said, we know the helicopter was shot down and that it burned, but we don't know any more about that and we will keep you posted. And with those correspondences, the O'Donnell family began 28 years of that kind of communication with the U.S. Army. Fast forwarding a little bit, by 1978, eight years after this happened, they were convinced, the family, that Michael had not survived the war and they couldn't continue in this way. So they asked the president to declare him legally dead and end this story. And so Jimmy Carter wrote a letter of condolence to the family. They declared him legally dead and that meant that the family could no longer collect pay for a missing soldier and it meant that they had closed this chapter in their lives because they believed he hadn't survived. Here we see a photograph of O'Donnell when he was in his unit at Contum writing these poems. About three weeks after O'Donnell was shot down, Jim Lake and the rest of the members of his unit had to fly another such mission. As Jim Lake said when he interviewed me, he said it was terrible what happened with O'Donnell especially since we were all right there. We all saw it happen, and there's nothing we could do about it. Three weeks later, their, their unit had to fly another mission, and here, if you look very closely at this photograph, you will see two helicopters on the ground. One here, and one here. As these helicopters were transporting troops into battle, they were both shot down. The photograph was taken by another helicopter that was hovering in the distance. All of the members of these crews were killed except for two. These two guys ran away from the helicopter. One was shot and killed and the other was captured. This was in, on April 15, 1970 and he was returned home in 1973. And the unit continued. 
about <laughs> six months after that, the 170th Assault Helicopter Company was disbanded, and they're not, that, that meant that the unit no longer continued, and the war, as all of you know, wound down, and by 1975, it had ended. At the time the war ended in 1975, I think there were something like 1,500 men still listed as missing in action, maybe in a, a little bit more than that, of which one of them was Michael O'Donnell. These are just some photographs of the unit. Here we see, by the way, just before I move to the next part of this story, where O'Donnell was shot down. This information was conveyed to the family many, many years later. You see on the map here, Contum. Here, this was where his, that outpost was. They would fly up to Dock To where they would stage the missions. And he was killed just here. This is the border between South Vietnam and Cambodia, just here, in the middle of nowhere. In 1997, a, a Vietnamese peasant <coughs> farmer approached the authorities in Cambodia, I'm sorry, a Cambodian, approached the authorities and said, I found evidence of, a, of an heli American helicopter crash site. Then he produced some dog tags to prove that he was right, that, it, that indeed he had located it. So the O'Donnell family received, I don't know, you know, the 75th letter like that, saying that it's possible that we We've uh, identified the crash site of your son. In this case, we're especially confident because he has presented dog tags. Oddly enough, the dog tags misspelled O'Donnell's name. So no one knew what to make of that. Why the hell is the guy wearing dog tags that don't spell his name correctly? We don't know the answer to that question. But there it is. So the, <coughs> the next chapter then in O'Donnell's story and in the book talks about what the American government does to reclaim the remains of soldiers. This has been a theme in American military life of great importance ever since the Civil War. We spend today in 2010 more than $100 million every year looking for the remains of lost soldiers in Vietnam, Korea, and World War II, most of them in Vietnam. Whenever direct evidence is presented to the government that a, there has been a find, they launch a fact-finding team to see what can be discovered. This crash site was 40 kilometers away from the nearest nothing the middle of absolutely nowhere. No roads, no infrastructure, nothing. So this team that went in to investigate spent five days hiking and floating on rafts to get to it. How this peasant could remember where it was is another question, but he did. They identified the site and agreed that it should be excavated fully and comprehensively. And as I said, the Military Joint Task Force Full Accounting does all of this work at a very significant level. That's what they were called at the time this was done in 1998. They went in in March. And they spent about 30 days. They cleared an airport, a heliport, to bring in the materials. There were, I don't know, a dozen or so professionals, of forensic, forensics people, archaeologists, anthropologists, military people. And then they hired a few dozen local people that they also airlifted in to help do the basic work. The first step then is to walk the site and identify it. This helicopter has been sitting in this place since March 24, 1970. They then pinned all of the areas around where they found any kind of evidence of human remains or clothing, equipment, anything at all that might be useful or salvageable in an excavation, and they marked the site. They then removed from the site all of the vegetation. In this case, as I said, O'Donnell was shot down in a valley. So that valley also had water running through it for 28 years, especially during the rainy season. So a lot of material was lost. And you can see here, there's some water there in this valley. They were able to ascertain, of course, this helicopter was O'Donnell's by the number on the tail wing. And then they got to work excavating the site. Wherever there was evidence of anything, they would dig down. If the ground was wet, about a, a foot into the ground. And if it was dry, I don't know, eight inches or something, they had a protocol. And they would sift all of this material to look for bones. More often than not, when these teams are doing this sort of work, they're able to identify the dead simply by the evidence of a few teeth. That's all that remain. And in this case, that was true as well. This is the sort of stuff that they found 28 years later. Dog tags, some keys, a St. Christopher's medal, sunglasses, lots of other stuff too. Fragments of boots, some uniform things, that kind of stuff. In terms of human remains, they were able to identify seven of the eight American soldiers. There were four on, on the helicopter that were members of O'Donnell's crew, O'Donnell, the co-pilot, and the two door gunners. 
and then the three special ops guys. Of the seven, well, that's seven. Of the seven, they identified six, I should say, and one they weren't able to. Here's uh, dog tags that they found. There were two sets of them. One was correctly spelled, one was misspelled. These were the correct, these were the, the misspelled ones. If you look on the left, you see the two Ds, and Michael's misspelled too. That's a mystery. So the recovery took place. They were able to identify these people through DNA analysis. So Michael's sister, Patsy, was asked to provide that. And about a year later, they determined that they had made the identification. And so in the summer of August of 2001, the family was invited to a funeral at Arlington Cemetery, where this unit would be buried together. And here you see a photograph of Marcus Sullivan, as he looks today, standing in front of Michael's grave. This is the first time he was ever there. This was about three years ago. And the funeral took place. When I first got interested in this story, after Harold Evans' book, I went to the cemetery to visit, and all of the uh, area around there was dirt. It had just been buried. And I was struck by that, too, that uh, to talk about the lack of closure for all the people affected by this story, the fact that it was just a fresh grave, spoke to the immediacy of this issue for so many people who were involved. But the recovery then allowed that chapter to be closed. So there are two aspects to the story of O'Donnell that follow his death. One was what happened to his remains and the ways in which we can understand how the military and those around him dealt with that loss. Again, that's not unusual. There were 58,200 stories like that just from Vietnam. And that story we were able to trace fairly fully by virtue of the evidence and material that we found. And I have to say that, the, that what I was able to see from the military, the U.S. Army's correspondence with the families, that the level of concern that is provided to the lost soldiers is really quite remarkable. And that this went on, as I said, for 28 years. Lots and lots of letters. Indeed, I think it was sort of, in some ways, not intentionally brutalizing for the family to have this reopened again and again and again. But the Army didn't want to leave any stone unturned, and they spent many, many millions of dollars to excavate this site and bring the story to closure for the families. The other side of the story then concerns O'Donnell's poem and the impact of the war on all the people who lived it, the human side of the story. Jim Lake served out the rest of his time and went home. After flying these missions, he, he never recovered from the O'Donnell event. After about Another year, he served as a helicopter pilot back in the U.S., and then he left the Army. He decided to become a bush pilot in Australia, and he flew a helicopter there for a year or two because he knew how to do that, and then decided to go to law school. So he went to law school at the University of Washington, and he served as a lawyer for a few years. He didn't like that either. He was very restless, unsettled. He decided, quite remarkably, to join the Army again. And he became a fixed wing pilot, and then he spent the rest of his career flying fixed wing, not, um, not combat missions, but mostly transport missions, and ended up, as I said, in Afghanistan and Iraq many times. He's now retired, and he lives in Tacoma, Washington, where he has a landscaping business. Jane remarried. Remarried. Jane married. She spent several years, obviously, kind of working through this loss, and then she met someone else and married. She then got divorced and remarried, and now she's very happily settled, at least until before the oil spill, on the beach in the Gulf of Mexico. Marcus got married, became an English teacher. The woman that he married was also one of Michael's friends, and she passed away a few years ago, and Marcus has since remarried and is happily retired. Bobby Ross runs a helicopter business down in New Orleans. I suspect he has not changed one teeny tiny bit. He's a remarkable guy. <laughs> And others carried on with their lives. As I said, Patsy, Michael's sister, lives in New Orleans, I mean in Las Vegas. Michael's poem had a life as well. The poem I began with, If You Are Able, moved many people, not just me. There were many people who were deeply touched by what, what he had to say. And the poem found its way in a variety of places. On November 13, 1982, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was dedicated in Washington, and a book was published to commemorate that event with quotes from all kinds of people, from Winston Churchill to Gandhi, and in it there was one poem, and that was Michael's. That's the cover of it. Memorials all over the country took hold of Michael's poem and inscribed it in stone in their cities. Here we see just one, and there are many. 
in Junction City, Kansas. And the centerpiece of this exhibit in the middle is Michael's poem. If you go to New York, closer still, to the South Street Seaport area where the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is located, have any of you ever seen it? Yeah, it, that glass with the letters. At the very top, in the largest letters, is Michael's poem. So his poem had a life of its own. And his plaintive plea that we would remember those gentle heroes left behind seems to have had an impact. People read it. People embraced it. It has appeared in countless books. In the movie Hamburger Hill, starring Clint Eastwood, at the end of the movie, they run his poem. It's, I have, Patsy gave me this very large box full of the afterlife of Michael's poem and its effect, and its widespread. Little community commemorations of Vietnam or POWs, Michael's poem, more often than not, is trotted out as an example of how we should understand the war. During the same period, I think we saw an increased approach to reconciling ourselves to what happened to our soldiers, let alone what happened to our country in Vietnam. Many of you know this because, again, either you experienced it yourself directly or you heard about it, that soldiers who fought in Vietnam were not well treated when they returned home. Whether they were drafted or enlisted, whether they served honorably or not, it didn't matter. These were not heroes. I heard from two members of Michael's unit the following story, and it is not unusual. They were brought back through San Francisco, a cruel irony if ever there was one. They were in uniform and got off the airplane and went to go have a drink in the bar at the airport. And some guy came up to them and said, are you guys just back from Vietnam? And they said, yeah, we are. And he said, it must have been tough. And he walked over to his table and he picked up his drink and went back over and poured it over their heads. Um, and one of these soldiers said, he's actually recorded talking about this on film in a documentary in tears, that all he could do not to kill this man, but he wanted to see his family and he didn't want to go to jail. This was not unusual. When Marcus got home from Vietnam in San Francisco, the first thing he did, along with others, was went to the men's room and took off their uniforms so they could walk in peace through the airport. Several things happened, I think, that began to transform our attitudes about soldiers from Vietnam. And I would like to believe that Michael's poem had played a little contribution to that. The film in 1978, The Deer Hunter, was very powerful at the time in giving people a whole different view of how to think about this, especially, as I said, Jan Scruggs, who, led, who produced the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. That was the next big moment. No doubt many of you remember what an extraordinary controversy that was in 1982 when it was dedicated and how so many people thought it was an appalling monument and a disgrace to our country. But for the Vietnam veterans, it was the most powerful kind of memorial one could imagine. And even today, if you go there any day of the week, but especially on Veterans Day or Memorial Day, you will see veterans and their families crying at the wall. There's some, and this actually relates to my last lecture, somehow seeing the name of the dead inscribed in stone connects them in a way that makes immediate and powerful that loss. Somehow connecting with the material world is so important. And then, as I said earlier, I think Robert McNamara's book was extraordinarily important because of what McNamara acknowledged. He wanted to clear the record. He made the case that it was an honest error of judgment and not a malicious or duplicitous act of leadership that he engaged in. I have talked with members of Johnson's cabinet, and they said that Johnson was wrongheaded in this but that he was trying to do what he thought was right. Whatever one makes of those arguments, the fact is that the American people were not aware of the nature of the deliberations the government was making or the facts or the evidence the government had at the time of the war. Indeed, fast forward to Iraq and Afghanistan. These issues have come back to us. But for all of those reasons, we learned something. And it was to allow us, I think, to understand the difference between what it means to be a soldier and what it means to be a policymaker. And I'd like to conclude my remarks by just reading a little excerpt from the book on this topic, and particularly how we think about war poetry in this context. It is widely and generally recognized among those who have had direct experience of battle that there is no adequate means for conveying the full nature of the experience to those who have not. Notwithstanding this general premise, there has been a long-standing interest among writers and filmmakers in trying to tell war stories, and in so doing to capture something of its essence. To be sure, such films as Save it, Saving Private Ryan offered groundbreaking access to the sound and fury of battle, 
as the first 30 minutes of the film does so well. But it is absurd to imagine that an experience in a theater accompanied by popcorn and a soft drink can offer the viewer even a remote sense of the trauma and sheer terror of battle. But viewed as a collective enterprise, literature, historical writing, poetry, and film have contributed a great deal to our understanding of war from perspectives that would otherwise be unavailable. <coughs> it is perhaps fair to say that poetry has offered a particularly compelling perspective on war because of the greater literary freedom that the form allows, and because so much wartime poetry was written by actively engaged soldiers who knew exactly what was happening. As J.D. McClatchy has written about the poets of the Civil War, whether overwhelmed or partisan or detached, they brought to the crisis poetry's unique ability to stir the emotions, to freeze the moment, to sweep the scene with a panoramic lens and suddenly swoop in for a close-up of suffering or courage. In the First World War, the British soldier poets offered unique contributions in capturing the grueling and appalling conditions of trench warfare, as well as the psychological state of individuals pushed beyond the limits of human endurance through protracted exposure to inconceivable hardships. In the Second World War, the American poets created a body of work comparable in importance, if utterly different in content, thinking of people like Randall Jarrell from the monument achieved by such British poets as Brooke, Sassoon, Graves, and Owen. The Vietnam War poets have contributed fundamentally to the literature of the war by offering a wide range of perspectives on what was so clearly a controversial and deeply emotional experience for the nation. Many of the themes expressed in the work of the Vietnam poets are interconnected, but the, dis but the distinctive perspectives offered by each can be startling. If Michael O'Donnell's poem, If You Are Able, compels us to reflect on those who were left behind, John Balaban's In Celebration of Spring, 1976, provides a deeply disturbing image of what being left behind actually means. And this is his poem. In a delta swamp in a united Vietnam, a marine with a bullfrog for a face rots in equatorial heat. An eel slides through the cage of his bared ribs. At night, on the still battlefields, ghosts like patches of fog lurk into villages to maunder on doorstills or cratered homes. While all across the United States, in this 200th year of revolution and the rights of man, the wounded walk about and wonder where to go. And today, in the simmer of lyric sunlight, a chrysalis pulses in its mushy cocoon under the bark of a gnarled root of an elm. In the brilliant creek, a minnow flashes delirious with gnats. The turtle's heart quickens its taps in the warm bank sludge. As she chases a frisbee spinning in sunlight, a girl's breasts bounce full and strong. A boy's stomach, as he turns, is flat and strong. In contrasting, that's the poem. In contrasting a dead marine with an attractive young couple playing with a frisbee on a bountiful spring day, Balaban provo provokes us to reflect not only on loss, but on the gruesome tragedy of untimely death in war. As a war poet, Michael O'Donnell focused on the themes of loneliness, loss, and the interior life of a helicopter pilot who had almost daily exposure to death, but spent each evening back at base enacting a wearying routine that eroded his spirit and seemly, seemed gradually to prepare him for his own death. For the sadness found in his poems and his inevitable destiny in Vietnam Michael O'Donnell's life is reminiscent of Greek tragedy. In the summer of 2001, when O'Donnell and his crew were first buried in Arlington Cemetery, the expansive lawns around them quietly awaited the dead of future wars. That area today is nearly filled, containing the graves of those killed in the cities and towns of Afghanistan and Iraq. The protracted conflict in the Middle East has, as of this writing, cost more than 5,000 American lives like the war in Vietnam, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have engendered much controversy. Yet no longer do American citizens place the blame for controversial or misguided policies on the soldiers who did the fighting and dying. In the decades since the end of the conflict in Vietnam, the nation has learned to distinguish between its civic responsibilities to question government policies from our community's desire to embrace our soldiers. Today, Section 60 at Arlington is crowded with gravestones 
row upon row, meticulously aligned. They are distinguished, not by the particular war that claimed them, but for the unifying ideals of honor and shared sacrifice that inspired them. Perhaps this is Michael o O'Donnell's enduring legacy. Thank you. I realize in retrospect that um, probably not the happiest subject upon which to send you all home, but we have time for a few questions, I think, a few minutes. Yeah. yeah. I have one question of the eight special ops people. How many did they find and how many were interred? Do you have any information? Well, yes. All of the remains, there were, well, there were eight special ops guys of which five were Montagnards and they couldn't identify their bones. So they, their remains, they were never identified. They were never distinguished. The three were, along with the four member, three of the four members of the helicopter crew. The families of all of them agreed to have them buried together at Arlington, but one. One family wanted their remains brought back to their town. And they were all buried in, in 2001. Yeah. What kind of emotional toll has this been on you? Well, it's, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I'm of an age where the Vietnam War for me was an, a colossal bore. I was a teenager, a young teenager. It was on the news every single day. I didn't pay any attention to it. And a lot of people in my generation were like that. And when I read this poem, somehow it touched me that this story needs to be told, and this is something I need to know more about. And as I said at the beginning of my remarks, we are all blessed with the capacity to be lifelong learners, and I wanted to know more. The more I've learned about it, it's, it's been a, it, it has, I've been found in a very rewarding process. All of these people that I have met have become friends of mine. All of these people are wonderful, interesting people that are now part of my world. And and I think we're doing something worthwhile. So it's been in many ways, it's a sad story, but it's an uplifting one because there is a consequence to this young man's life. He touched many people and that's the story I want to tell. Yes, Heidi in the back. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to the poem is sent to Marcus and then it becomes public. What about that process of, did he personally decide this should go public and when? Did he do that, and, and how did he feel about that, as he's sent this as a private poem? It's a wonderful question. Michael was, while he was in Vietnam, writing these poems and assembling them in a book he was calling Letters from Play Coup. And it was his intention at the end of the war maybe to publish them. He wrote poems and music back in the United States when he was in college that he called an ice cream season because he knew that was the happiest time of his life. Right after he was killed, it was the sad duty of his colleagues, Jim Lake and others, to empty out. You always go through the footlocker of your buddies before you send it home to make sure there's nothing in there that you don't want to send home. And they knew he had been writing poems, and they were also moved by them. They made copies of them and sent them all over the place. And a British journalist named Brian Benton, who was in effectively embedded at the 170th at the time, took these poems back with him to England and had them published in the London Daily Express, where they then took on a life of their own. They were then published here and there. So Marcus never disseminated the poem. They just found its way into the world. And a few years later, Marcus was teaching English, and he received a call from Tom Brokaw. They wanted to do a story on, or on the NBC News about, about this poem. And they then went and filmed Marcus in class one day. And so the, the poem had taken off. but. Patsy took on the burden of having to authorize every reproduction of this poem. And she worked very hard to try to protect the use of it. So he, they received some wacky requests that somebody wanted to do a musical about it, and she didn't like that, and I don't know. So um, she became the steward of the copyright. Yeah, Glenn? Do you know how many Lafayette students were killed in the, in the war? In Vietnam? I don't know offhand. It's a wonderful question. It's about a dozen, maybe, something like that. Yeah. My, <coughs> my Lafayette experience, uh, 44 years ago, around this time, I was entering Lafayette, and our summer reading program, we had a special reading program. I have a couple of classmates. Do you remember this? We were asked to read special readings on one topic only, all about the Vietnam War, three special books. And the, really? the freshman year, the first week, we had a symposium on that. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think it was a, an entire day.
devoted just to Vietnam. And 66, what it makes 67 you're talking 66. about? 66. Okay. 60, six, the, the, year, the, the year of 66, 67 at Lafayette. Yeah. Right, right. I didn't know that. And so we began video. with that. That was our entire college experience began with that and kind of shaped it in a way. Wow. Yeah. And we had, I had the experience of fraternity brothers coming back, having been wounded, having been injured, uh, on R&R, &R, going back to the war. Yeah, we saw the whole um, war on television every Sunday. Yeah, before I mean, it was very brothers. real for, yeah. you, you, your experience, it wasn't real. It was real for us. I know, oh, I know, <laughs> I, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was in your class, yeah. and, uh, you know, we were baby boomers. This was a central event of our, a central event of our lives, and, um, and I was active protesting yeah. the Vietnam yeah. War. Yeah. Here at Lafayette, and and by my last year, 1970, just after the announcement of the invasion of Cambodia and Kent State, things became so uh, 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 chaotic. Chaotic <laughs> that uh, <laughs> ca they called on okay. finals that year. But the but the thing that I have uh, uh, the thing the thing that I'm that listening to that story uh, that just hits me is um, was a tremendous sense of. Uh, about the fact that um, so few uh, of my cohorts of my entire generation, but also here at Lafayette, uh, had to go through what Michael did. Um, you know, uh, Michael was a, was a tiny minority of people my age who were educated and middle class who, were, who went to Vietnam. Voluntarily. Uh, um, and and, and, and uh, uh, there were so many ways to get out of Vietnam. Um, you know, uh, if you if you didn't get a good number, I got a good number my last year at Lafayette. I didn't in the in the lottery. Uh, it was real easy to get your doctor uh, to uh, fake a letter saying you didn't have to serve. Uh, not to mention going off to Canada or wherever. And, and a lot of people considered that. But I have a tremendous sense of guilt of, of this baby boom generation. That while in one sense Vietnam, you know, was a central event in terms of coming of age, protest, uh, 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 seeing, uh, you know, America's role in the world and, 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 and wanted to point it in a different direction, but also the fact that so many uh, 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 of uh, our generation who weren't as lucky as us, um, uh, particularly minorities and the poor, had to do this terrible fighting. And, and, and when I hear stories, even then, when I was a Vietnam protester, I, 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 I made me sick, but more so now, about, about uh, veterans coming back and getting spit on or, 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 or the, the glass, whatever it was, that was thrown on them. It just, it just, it's, it, it just saddens me even more. Um, Vietnam is, 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 a, is a terrible thing uh, for uh, our generation. No, I would have been a freshman at the time. You, you, were, were you were a senior. senior, and I remember that very clearly. And, and I remember being sent home. And um, during the next few years, two people from my senior class in high school were killed in Vietnam, and they were both minorities, and I had that same guilt. I could come back here and sort of escape where those people who couldn't afford to escape that I knew ultimately were killed. But um, we were in New York during Fleet Week um, earlier this spring, and hundreds, if not thousands, of US sailors and Marines we're in Midtown Manhattan, and we uh, had lunch at a bar, and there must have been 30 or 40 service people in this uh, Chi Chi's restaurant. And I was struck by the number of people who came up to the servicemen and thanked them and congratulated them. And that went on all day long throughout the streets of Midtown. And it was just such a um, startling change from the people who came home from Vietnam in the 70s and that reaction, which obviously we all saw. Yeah, yeah. It was a terrific change. Yeah. When I was in my senior year, I got a call from my cousin who was going to LaSalle. And he said, what are you going to do when you graduate? What do you mean? Well, I started to graduate. And I said, you have a suggestion? He said, yes, you can join the National Guard. So in my last three or four months at Lafayette, every Monday, I would finish classes, I'd get on a bus at 3 o'clock and I'd go back to Philadelphia and have a Monday night drill. 
And then what year is this? If I may ask. Excuse me. What year? Sixty-four. Okay. And um, I went away for uh, basic training that summer, and everything we were trained for was to fight in Vietnam. Every uh, story that the sergeants told you was about what you had to be prepared for in mm -hmm. Vietnam. And the next year we had double training. We had a weekend plus a Monday night every week for the year. And we had our yellow fever shots, our cholera shots, everything. Because in the Korean War, that's what they did. They sent three divisions of the National Guard to Korea. And Robert McNamara came to the president and said, it's a lot cheaper to draft people than take older men, many of them with time and grade and families. And it, we never went. But that's how close wow. it was. Well, there are questions or comments? What do you do with the artifact? Well, the, all of the written documents that have been uh, filed, and, and I, in f when she gave me this stuff, it was all just dumped in there. You could tell m many of the envelopes were never opened. They just, they, it was so painful. So we've archived all of it and filed it and organized it. And I will, when the work is done, with her permission, donate it to some library here or somewhere. Where that, but I also have you know, some baby pictures and it's all that stuff. I don't know what to do with that. She has no children. Patsy doesn't. And I, I imagine I'll give it all to Marcus, who was his best friend and you know closest thing to family that he has. Yeah. Is there any uh, plans to do anything with the music that you have in your possession? Um, I mean, it sounds pretty good. What that little bit we heard. Yeah, there, there's some of those songs are good, and then uh, there are also these recordings of him just singing himself on a reel to reel while he's sitting in his bass that are also pretty good. I have talk, been talking to a documentary filmmaker about this, and he's interested in making a documentary about the subject because. Again, there, there's uh, so much material. I need to finish the book first so that he has what to work with. And I'm hopeful that he'll do something like that because I think it's a powerful story. If you had asked me that question in March, I would have said August. But it's not going to be August. Uh, it's probably by Christmas. I'm close. The book is all outlined. Many of the chapters are written. They're all, I'm close. So I'm hoping by Christmas to have it done. Um, it's really just a matter of finding the time, and this nutty day job gets in the way. <laughs> <laughs> wow. so Is the publisher going to be? I don't know yet. We're not sure. University um, Press or commercial? I, I don't know. I, I'd rather it not be University Press, but we'll see. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough time to get books published in this economy. So a good press would be my first choice. Are, are you basically yeah. writing it and Marcus is editing it, or is it both of you writing and...? It's uh, me writing it, and Marcus is a great partner, and he and I, he goes with me on all of our interviews and all of that stuff, and he's gained access to all of this material. And it's a great collaboration because I, I really know what I want to write, and he's good with that. So I draft it, and then I give it to him, and he makes some comments. And so it's working pretty well. Um, and he provides a kind of perspective that you know, he was there. So, well, thank you all very much. <laughs>